I mean, this is where it all started, so to speak, that um, when the king, there was a period in the middle of the 1600s, you may remember when we got rid of our kings and there was a commonwealth, um, and that when the, when the Westminster Parliament, the English Parliament, negotiated, when the Scots negotiated with the king to come back, um, they were much stricter about how, because there'd, there'd be always been tensions between royalty and parliament over how much money royalty should have and uh, whether parliament should have control of that. And one of the things that was settled was that the, the royalty could have the taxes on overseas uh, colonial uh, products coming, the import taxes coming into Britain. And the Royal African Company um, was set up because uh, the king wanted to increase the amount of um, imports that were coming in because obviously that was going to in increase his income. And so he set up the Royal African Company with the idea that they could, um, they could bring labour from West Africa, they could bring enslaved labour from West Africa. They were always trying to get... Um, ordinary British people, well, they weren't British at that time, English and Scottish people, to go to Jamaica. But there was a limited amount wanted to go, and they never felt they had enough to really expand in the way that they wanted to. So the king set up the Royal African Company. Second problem they had was that a lot of the people who'd gone to Jamaica, um, they, they, they were, land was cheap, it was almost given away. It was a bit like they had schemes a bit like, could you remember the £10 palms or whatever? You could go to Australia very cheap. They had schemes like that. So people turned up in Jamaica. They didn't have capital. So they didn't have capital to buy these enslaved people who were going to push up the production. And so the merchants on this side of the Atlantic offered to lend them, to set, offered in a sense to lend them the money. They said, if you, if you, you, if we will approve you and give, give, let you have some of the slaves that the king's bringing in. Um, <coughs> if you promise to send all your production to us, so it looked like a really good deal for the merchants, and the merchants in here in Scotland were also involved in it. That um, they would, they would get all the sugar or all the uh, cotton or tobacco or whatever that was being produced in the colonies they would get, have a monopoly on that and they would um, process it and sell it far and wide and um, they'd make mon money out of the loan, but they'd also make money out of getting all this production and um, selling it. Seemed like a really good idea. But the planters were very crafty. Um, there were Dutch people, there were Spanish people, uh, ships coming in and out of the Caribbean, and uh, they found they could get a good price with the Dutch or with the, with the Spanish, and they, they very often didn't send their goods home. So the Royal African Company collapsed with masses of debt. And <clears throat> I'm telling you this because it's a very important basis for what happened, um, what, how slavery developed. They, so they, they, had, they, they collapsed in debt, and the, the, um, the kings, and the problem that they had was that the courts in England wouldn't deal with these debts because they, they said, we, the Lord, law, we can deal with debts on things, houses, furniture, property, but we can't deal with debts on people. Our law doesn't cover that. So the king went to Parliament and said, look, we need a change in the law. We've got to cover all this, this particular problem that we have. Parliament said, don't think we can do that because that would totally undermine all the structure of legal rights that we have that's built up over the years to say that people can be things, people can be property. However, royalty went behind the scenes and, it's, it's, and, and established, I suppose I would call them corrupt lawyers who were willing to judge um, that people were property. But the upshot of having, of, of, when you hear people talking about slavery, particularly Jeff Palmer is always very careful to say it was chattel slavery. And what we mean by chattel slavery is that once you class these people as things, as chattels in law, 
not only could you, uh, the great advantage was you could remortgage them. So you get, you buy your hundred slaves on a loan, you send your sugar to Scotland, and within 18 months, you probably paid off the loan, a couple of harvests. <laughs> now you can remortgage them. You can take another hundred, get another hundred slaves and get them to pay off their mortgage. And then you're thinking, I think I'd like to go home. I'll mortgage the slaves and I'll build myself a nice house or I'll buy myself a nice estate or I'll set myself up in, uh, in, in, with a chemical works or a, or a woolen factory or whatever. So the slaves became a source of capital. And even 150 years later, long established planters still had mortgages on their slaves, their enslaved people. And the reason they had those mortgages was this continuous process of using these people as capital. So that it allowed a great amount of, cap put a lot, a great amount of capital in the hands of Scots to invest in all sorts of other things. That makes sense to you, right? So it's important, that point is important because it's how we did so many other things because we suddenly, we had a poor, on the whole, our land was not very, hugely productive. It wasn't hugely fertile. We do have some nice fertile parts of Scotland, but we have an awful lot of rough land. So many estates, didn't make a lot of money and uh, incomes were not very high. So suddenly there was this great influx of capital coming in to Scotland, which was obviously very attractive. So let's have a little look. Um, there's the island of Jamaica. Um, and the part where the, most of the Scots went to is on this western side of the island. And they tended to crowd together over here. So it was, like a, a, a Scottish community, um, and then they spread themselves all round here, which is very fertile land uh, for uh, growing sugar. It's very mountainous in the middle of the island, and the, the shores in part are quite rocky. And if you were approaching it, it might have looked a little bit like Scotland, with the highland behind and the fertile green area along the coast. Um, but it's a small island. It's only 45 miles east to west, west to east. Um, <clears throat> so it's quite small. But it became the source of <clears throat> more important to Scotland and to England than all the tobacco in Virginia and all the cotton. It's sugar. Like sugar's an addictive substance. Once people had tasted it, and if you worked your slaves really hard, production became, grew just exponentially and um, the money flowed. So sugar is what they grew mostly. So here's the sugar estate. Now, I don't know whether you can see this clearly. See that they've got it all marked out in squares. They're hoeing now and planting. Um, it's marked out in squares because every planter knew how much sugar he'd got to produce in order to pay back the loan. So a, a, the, if you were buying an enslaved person, um, I'll just make sure I've got the figures right, yeah. 2,400 pounds of sugar, um, which was worth about 17 pounds. So somewhere around between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds of sugar. And you wanted that produced as fast as you could. So you measured out how many plants, how much sugar. So that's why it's so carefully measured out, not in rows, but in squares. So you can, these pieces could be added up. You also had to write to the person who lent you the money and let them know how many pieces, how many, how many plants you put in and what you were expecting because they were waiting, you, waiting for you to pay back and they wanted their money back quite quickly, two, three years which is one reason why you'll find that this man here um, is holding a whip. They, they drove the, um, the production. They, had, they were meeting a deadline to pay their money back. This um, 
these pictures I'm showing you were done as um, they're sort of a piece of propaganda in a way. Because although they're accurate about Jamaica, they're not actually accurate about the enslaved people. There's no way that they actually, all of the personal accounts that I read of people who had visited and been into the fields and seen the slave gangs working, they worked uh, topless. You're not going to, they, the owners of the enslaved people bought their clothing. There's no way they're going to whip them and spoil their clothing. They work topless. But there was a lot of sensitivity here in, um, in Scotland about that. So they, um, when they were illustrating, they illustrated them with all their clothes on, but that wasn't quite true. The other thing that's not quite accurate, every slave list, and there were lists sent here to Scotland, and you can find them in the archives and in family letters. You had to send to the people who lent you the money, letting them know that the slaves are all alive and this is what they're working at. And this is how many pieces of, um, of uh, sugar cane we planted. And this is our expectation for paying back our loan. So they, they, all, of, all of the lists that I saw, um, the men, the people, the enslaved people imported into Jamaica, the majority uh, of them were men, about 60% were men, lots of children, but 60% men. But the women were the ones who got this field work. The men got the jobs as carpenters and sugar boilers and cattle um, men and, and looking after the, the uh, mules and all of those kind of jobs. And the, um, the women got the jobs in the fields. Men thought it was a, a demotion in a way. It was a punishment for them to be sent out with the field gang, the young women. So when we talk about the massive production that there was and the massive amounts of money that were made, it's in our mind we probably think men, but actually <coughs> we have to think teenage girls. They were the ones who did the hard work in the fields. And so this is inaccurate in that way as well. It would have been majority girls, and it would have been, they would have been stripped to the waist. They wouldn't have been clothed like that. So this is a little bit of um, whitewashing, of the, if we can use that word, of the whole situation. But um, the other thing that's interesting, um, I don't know how many you've got your jeans on today, um, the, the, the linen that they were clothed in was a, a very not, you know, nondescript kind of, um, I think, Burns poetry described it as dun colored, sort of a brownish, muddy colored linen. And they didn't, they didn't like it. They brought with them from West Africa a knowledge of how to grow indigo and how to dye their clothing. And a man called David Stewart from Edinburgh, who went over there and wrote an account that I read, he said, um, they dye their, uh, their trousers blue and they called them blue jeans. So if you may have thought that they were invented in America, I rather think that actually it was Jamaican slaves who gave us blue jeans. But that's just one of the many things that we, um, that, that we don't know about them, that we think uh, that they were somehow um, not, not clever, not intelligent, not bringing with them all sorts of skills. Scots didn't know how to grow anything in tropical soils. It was these young girls who, who, who farmed in Africa who brought with them all that knowledge about planting and looking after um, anything growing in tropical soils. So here they are getting in the harvest. Oh, that's a bit dark, isn't it? Can you see that? Um, uh, <clears throat> the, um, I don't want to be sure that I... So this is the picture of this is the picture of harvest time, right? I should say to you at this point that the linen that they wore, um, our production of linen, once we were a little involved in this slavery economy, rose at, with almost in parallel with the number of enslaved people, because we made a very hard working, uh, scratchy sort of linen which became, as people became better off in Europe, it was less popular. 
It was absolutely ideal for the purpose of work clothing. So our linen was most, a lot of our linen was exported to a place like Jamaica. There were 170,000 Scots, men and women and children, all producing at the very stages of linen production, involved in sending linen across the water to Jamaica. So a huge number of Scots were involved in an industry that was tied up with this whole economy. They were fed. Enslaved people were given a little bit of land in, in a part of the estate, part of the plantation that um, wasn't suitable for sugar. They were given a bit of land to grow their own food, but the protein that they, so they grew um, cabbage and green things and vegetables and whatever. They, but the protein that they were given was the cheapest that could be bought, and that was oily fish from Scotland. We had um, huge, uh, we built up a massive export trade in salted and smoked herrings at that time. The herring fisheries from the east and west coast went off to Jamaica and uh, people were given uh, a small ration of fish. And that's why smoked fish and ackee is the national dish of Jamaica because they still eat it to this day. It's still the, the uh, I think the ham hocks went to, um, went to America, to Virginia, and theirs is hock and greens, but our, the fish went to Jamaica. And it employed, again, a whole lot of rural families caught up in this slave economy because they were selling their fish and they could, there the, was a great expansion of fish sales. Again, they're dressed in ways that they probably would be a lot more undressed than that. Now, this is looking down on Kingston. And this is, um, so this is, this here is Kingston. And it looks wonderfully peaceful. But actually, this became, Kingston became the biggest slave market in the world. The slaves from West Africa that were picked up in West Africa were brought into here. And then they were, they were sent on, buyers would uh, buy groups of them. They were sent on to the Spanish colonies, to Virginia and elsewhere. But this was the landing place where they came in. And because the Scots were um, very quick to be involved in Jamaica, um, they were, I said a third the other day, and a Jamaican historian corrected me and said 50%. Scots were the dealers traders there were a, I, I my work showed said a third but I, as I said I was corrected by an academic the other day who said no there were half of them anyway there were a very high proportion of the people who marketed slaves in Kingston and sold them on to Virginia and Spain but also into the other Caribbean islands so we were we were also um, very much involved there Now, let me see if I can bring this together for a minute. Let's just think about, we talk about a triangular trade. It was a very complex trade, and this is what I want to kind of um, get you to understand. Um, I said the people in the, plant, the, the, the plantations sent their orders to the slave, to the merchants here in Scotland mainly around up the West Coast, the Clyde, but there were merchants here in Edinburgh too. So they sent the orders for slaves and um, they gave them in return a credit note to take to the slave market for a certain amount. And it was based on how much sugar they thought they could produce. If they had 100 slaves or 50 slaves, how much sugar would they produce? When the Clyde merchants had plenty of orders, they would look for people to invest in a, sending a ship down to West Africa to pick up some slaves. Now, the slave dealers, the traders in West Africa, wanted uh, not, not just anything. They wanted all the global luxuries of the world. They knew they had a very um, a, 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 pro, a 
if we can call it that, the people that they were selling were worth a lot. And so they demanded that they should have, or they wanted iron, which came from Sweden, which they could uh, smelt and turn into hoes and tools for their farming, and silk cloth and cotton and Venetian beads and all of those kind of global luxuries are what they wanted. And those were all those goods were sent down to West Africa to the traders. And the traders would come on board the ships and have a look what they had to exchange before they even let you look at the, uh, at the, the, the slaves that they had. So many were lost in this passage over the sea to uh, the Caribbean that it was thought wise to put doctors on board ships. And if you look at uh, the expansion of our medical schools and the opening of um, Glasgow's medical school, a massive expansion in the production of doctors in Scotland who worked on the ships and helped in West Africa to select the um, to select the enslaved people. So they were uh, brought across the sea to work here. And the, they were under pressure to produce the tobacco, the sugar, the cotton or whatever, and send it back to Scotland where it was processed. So some of our biggest industries, tobacco processing and selling, Tate and Miles sugar in Greenock, there were sugar, there were initially small sugar houses in Edinburgh and on the Clyde and dotted around Scotland, but eventually they became quite concentrated in certain places. So the, <coughs> the processing of the tobacco, the sugar, the cotton. So you can see at all these stages of investment, of um, bringing in imports, of trading, of planting, but we're making, the, the, the merchants of Scotland were making a bit of money at each stage of the process. So although it is a triangular trade, it's quite a complex one. And actually was for the times, we're talking about the 16, early 1700s, that these, all of these um, uh, processes are going on. But it's, it, it, what it does do is bring a lot of capital into Scotland that wasn't there before. It was a, a massive source of capital for us. Have we got the, got the idea? The diagram? <laughs> okay. Now, map of Britain. One of the reasons that Scotland became so much involved in slavery is Bristol was heavily involved, Liverpool, London too. But if you think of the curvature of the earth, how we, we look at the map and it looks flat, but when it's, when we think about it, and if you've ever flown to North America, you know the, the, the planes go up and over, don't they? Anyway, the boats did too. So the ships, rather than going, this, the, the ships were coming round over the top of Ireland. So we were on the route for the boats going out and the boats coming back in. Here in, you know, here in Scotland, we were very much on the route. Um, <clears throat> also, we were a, a very, um, we were a Protestant, uh, two Protestant countries after 1707, when we were pulled together. Britain was fiercely Protestant, and we had our, the French and Spanish that we were constantly fighting with those Catholic countries. So this little, Straits of Dover here was quite a dangerous place, but even for the London boats, and many of those went up and round and um, round the top of Scotland. I was surprised when I was reading people's stories of how they travelled that that's the way they went, even from Leith. I thought they'll be going down, surely, but actually they're going up round the top. And so the route, the routes to North America, the routes to all the, the ships going that way were coming along our shores, they were maybe coming in to fill up with water before they went, or, or, or food products before they crossed the Atlantic. So I'm going to just take this as an example, Campbelltown, um, because it will give you some idea of how much involved we were, because um, all of our little uh, towns, little ports all around Scotland became drawn into 
um, this kind of trade. The other advantage, so we had an advantage that it, getting to North America or getting to the Caribbean, you saved about 10 days on the outward journey and 10 days coming back. So that was worth a lot to traders because they had took less food, took less water with them, and it, uh, so they saved a lot that way. But also, even after 1707, when, um, when the two countries came together, um, we, the Scots had much lower uh, import taxes. Now, I said to you, all those global goods that they had to put onto the ships, the, one of the best places um, and work for loading um, the, the iron ore from Sweden and the, the, the global goods was around this west coast here. Um, I, I think smuggling was also a kind of national pastime. Um, there were this, that often there were all kinds of uh, deals went on. And it's surprisingly, it's surprising the number of uh, foreign ships from Liverpool, from Bristol, from all over the world coming into Campbelltown Harbour. And the amount of iron ore, the amount of all of these global goods that were import, supposedly coming into Campbelltown, but obviously they were coming and they were being reloaded onto ships that were going out. When I was speaking in um, Stromness up in Orkney, um, somebody told me they'd found Venetian beads in the harbour there. Yet somebody who dived. Uh, did I think that could have been coming off one of these ships? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. But um, let's just have a look. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. <coughs> These are the town councillors of Campbelltown. These are the ones that I could find anyway. And they had shares in some of these ships that were going out, uh, passing through Campbelltown. There were, I found um, <coughs> about 25 ships that were coming in and out regularly that would appear on the, on the, um, there's a, a national, there's a database of slave ships that, that's been put together recently. So we can track some of these. So about 24 ships were regular uh, of those ships that mainly, as far as I can see, worked in the slave trade were coming in and out of Campbelltown. But many of the town councillors, and I did locate a few of them, um, and families in Campbelltown who had shares in ships. They, they, to, to equip a ship was a very uh, expensive business, so often it was several people with shares. So <clears throat> two ships here, the Dolphin and the Happy Return. The Dolphin made 65 voyages, 11,532 enslaved people, as far as we know, on board, but only 9,200 um, odd actually arrived. There was a, a, a lot of people, they were so crowded in these boats, a lot of them died. They also had shares in the Happy Return. And again, you'll see that the loss was somewhere between about 15, 7, 16%. The Stuarts, more town councillors, that's the dates. Um, they had shares in the Betty, the Isabella and the Peggy. And you can see the Betty made 172 voyages, uh, 34,000 slaves actually landed. The Harveys were a local family. They had, they had uh, shares, as far as I could see, in the King George that uh, made 47 voyages, probably a smaller ship, I think. The Ballantines. Now, because they were town councillors and they were controlling the harbour, they would be controlling this exchange of goods. So all of the goods coming in from the iron ore from Sweden or the or, or the rich cloth from, uh, they avoided the East India Company, brought it in uh, without tax, high taxes on it, and could obviously buy it cheaper and get it onto their boats cheaper. But here's the Ballantines, and they were obviously uh, the Hope. Uh, they got shares in that 117 voyages, carrying 22,000. These are all from the, the database that, the, that has been put together globally of the ships, all the records of all the ships that have gone in and out. And you can look at that on the internet and um, have a look. Uh, I haven't done this kind of <coughs> analysis for lease, 
if you had any source of the names of boats that were common um, in Leith, you'd be able to have a look whether any of them were involved in this way. Right, I'll leave him for a minute. Um, I was going to also give you some other figures for that I looked up for Glasgow. Um, a man called Duncan Campbell. I think we know that these days that the Campbell's the most common surname in Jamaica, right? Duncan, Daniel Campbell, I should say. Daniel Campbell's, um, there was a fire in his, well, actually, I think there was a riot, and that's why he had a fire in his house in, in Glasgow. But um, he, he had shares in the Union, the Concord, the Seaflower, the Antelope, the Dove, the Hopewell, the Anne, the Pelican, the Expedition, and the James. But he also partnered up with ships from Liverpool and ships from Bristol. So we could do this analysis. Air looks pretty much the same. Um, that the town councillors, the people who controlled the town, um, were, in, as far as I can see, they were involved in, um, in the importation of the global goods, the transfer of those global goods onto these ships that were going down to West Africa. So they were directly involved, but because they knew it was a lucrative business, they had shares in the ships. So I think we would find probably, perhaps not so heavily because you're on the East Coast, but Leith and the, the certainly Stromness at the top and the East Coast ports look pretty much the same. Kukubri, I looked at the records in Kukubri, Dumfries, this is the picture that emerges from that. So we were heavily involved in that way, in, in, in the actual trading of, of uh, slave trading. Just go back to just a minute, because I just wanted to show you. Because the, we, I said, spoke about planters. Now, planters brought one or two people from home to help them on the plantation. But they rapidly accumulated hundreds of workers, enslaved workers. And so the legislation, British government legislation after, after 1707, British government legislation, which was uh, for, for Jamaica, um, quickly differentiated between white people and black people. The black people had to be um, held down, had to be... Um, so they, they, all the measures, um, the white workers quite quickly were treated differently and they were not to be naked and they were given minimum levels of clothing and food, which black workers weren't necessarily given at that time. Um, there was very harsh punishments and lots of control came in in the early 1700s. And then there was um, restrictions in the 1730s that they couldn't... Um, they, they couldn't take other jobs. They, they couldn't, uh, you couldn't be employed in taverns and whatever because once people had these enslaved people and they didn't have to pay them any wages, they could give them all sorts of jobs to do. They were, they were, they were quite skilled, some of them, when they came. Um, and then they set up a militia, a, vol a group of volunteers to act as a, a kind of um, army to march out from the barracks and and after the rebellious, if there was any rebellions, that they had people to put them down. Later on, they stationed troops in the centre of the island, particularly Scottish troops, actually. Um, and then, so all of these restrictions came in, a kind of very early apartheid. Up until then, we hadn't had any legislation that differentiated between by colour of skin between white and black. But that was the start of that kind of thinking, that these people will have to be treated differently. And to justify the diff different treatment, we began to tell people that they were different, that they weren't quite as value, you know, of, of the same value. Um, and those kind of ideas of white supremacy are implanted at that time. Now, um, Zachary Macaulay. I'm going to talk about him a little bit later on, but he was a very, very important. Um, he was born in Inverary, uh, son of the Manson in Inverary, and he was 
a very important, we know the name of Wilberforce, but we don't know the name of Macaulay. And, and the, the anti-slavery committee, the group that was, um, that sort of ran the anti-slavery movement, they were of the opinion that they could not have done it without Zachary, that Zachary was the most important person in their group. He has a statue in Westminster Abbey. He has a, a plaque uh, in, in London. But we have, as far as I know, we have nothing in Scotland to celebrate our most important anti-slaver. Uh, I went to his hometown last week and convinced them they need to do something about that. But um, anyway, I thought I would just read you. Um, one of the governors of Jamaica came from Inverary and uh, Zachary's father had sent him to Glasgow to learn bookkeeping, to learn um, sort of like, a, 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 I suppose, just to go to a merchant house and learn how to keep the books and balance the books. And, um, but while he was in um, Glasgow, I think he was getting up to no good, or at least his family thought he was. They were particularly worried because he was taking, he was forming friendships with groups of university students who, whose approach to religion was a good deal more uh, sceptical than his father's and um, he was kind of worried. So he um, he spoke, the, the, the governor of Jamaica, <coughs> Archibald Campbell, had come home. He'd done his stint and he'd come home and um, Zachary's father spoke to uh, Archibald about you know, what could we going to do about Zachary and he said, well, just send him off to Jamaica to work. And that's what they did. And he wrote home uh, about his work as a bookkeeper. There's a bit of a misnomer bookkeeper because you, they did keep the books, um, but they handed out the rations and they also uh, managed the slaves. So he, he um, wrote home to family that the work he had been he was doing was laborious, irksome, and degrading to a degree of which I could not have, I could have formed no previous conception, and which none can imagine fully who have not, like me, experienced the vexatious, tyrannical, and pitiless conduct of, Jamaica, of the Jamaican overseer. I have no choice under the circumstances between doing the work and starving. I, I'm, I am exposed to the sight and practice over the severity of severities over others, which make my blood run cold. But the die has been cast and there's no retreating. I should, I should gladly return, but I don't have the means. He did eventually come back. But like many young men, he, he, he had no idea really what he was going to. He hadn't really considered. He was only, uh, at, he was 14 when he went to Glasgow. He was 16 when he went to Jamaica. A very young man, he had no idea what he was going into. And I'm sure that many went off to Jamaica in that spirit and then found that they didn't have the money to come home and they were stuck. <clears throat> but he went on to redeem himself. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in, let me get my notes so I'll make sure I've got the right dates. This is Bunce Island, um, just west coast of Africa. Can you see the little, um, here? This is where we, most of the slaves came from, particularly from what is now modern day Sierra Leone. And at one point, um, the, uh, the anti-slavery movement um, set up a, a place for freed Africans on that the modern day of Freetown. But Bunce Island here was where the Royal African Company originally set up. You remember I said that the, we, they set, had the Royal African Company. And they had a fortress on Bunce Island where they collected all the enslaved people together, ready to load them into boats. Um, but <clears throat> in, in the 1700s, mid-1700s, 1748 in fact, um, 
the Royal African Company decided to give up its monopoly because they weren't supplying the, the, the enslaved people fast enough for the expansion of all the sugar business and the cotton business in America and the tobacco. Um, and so they, they decided to end their uh, monopoly over this trade. And the island, Bunce Island, was bought by a Scottish consortium of the Grants, the Boyds, and the Oswalds. And so they took over um, the, uh, the castle on Bunce Island where they kept the slaves. And they took over from the Royal African Company. Um, and they became, uh, they, they're now in that third corner, you know, the three corners of the trade that now actually settled. And a number of um, slave, uh, a number of a number of families would have a plantation in Jamaica. They would have offices here in Scotland or down in London, and then they would have family members who were down in the, on the west coast overseeing the loading of the ships and all of that. So they were at each corner of the train. Now, um, so this is where this is where they were kept. Now, I want to um, maybe stop for a minute. Have you got any questions at this point that you'd like to raise before I go on and talk a bit further about um, the, the campaigns against slavery and what happened? Any well, thoughts? There's some ship there that uh, near the, uh, must be at least a quarter of the slaves must have died in that one. <clears throat> yes, yes. So what do they do? Did they just chuck them overboard? Or? Yes, I think if they, they, they threw their bodies overboard. Somebody said to me that there's like a trail of bones, or there was. But also, I think sometimes if they were so ill, became so weak, that they were not going to get any money when they, from the, when they exhibited them in the slave market. They probably threw sick ones overboard too. Um, so yes, I think that the... Uh, the diff that's something that's recorded in the in the, the database of um, in a <coughs> ship da database what they carried and how many arrived and it is quite shocking that um, of those figures I showed you that was you know there's thousands there twenty two thousand that were either thrown overboard or died just from those few Campbelltown boats that I uh, that I showed you. Seems strange that when Campbelltown is such a small place. Yes, and it was even smaller in those days, you know. But it, it, um, but that was their the business they were in, and that was the money they were making. Yeah. You would, they, you would never imagine it. I, I never for one moment thought that a small place like that, air, you, air, you can, um, uh, is is understandable, and um, Glasgow, of course, yeah. but you could. These other small towns also had had uh, things in the trade in one way or another, but they were far, they were far removed. You see, so it wouldn't have been obvious that that's what they were up to. But but um, if you local <laughs> accounts of people who visited Loch Fine, you know, at Inveraray and whatever, said there are boats sit from all over the world were sitting in Loch Fine and from Liverpool and from <coughs> Bristol. And, and so what were they doing there? They were exchanging, uh, getting loaded up with all the goods that they needed to go and exchange for slaves. Mm. If you go to Inverary Jail, they have uh, lists of uh, lots of crimes that have been committed there. Yes. And yeah. they tell you who were supposedly transported mm. to Australia. Yes. <clears throat> but the majority only got as far as the south coast of England. Mm. And they weren't actually sent. Any further. Oh, right. They just went to jail, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, it just made you wonder, you know, just how kind of disposable people were. Yes, know, yes, yes. Did you want to say something at the back? Uh, I, I want to ask you a question. Yes. You, you mentioned when you, when you showed us this slide on apartheid yes. legislation, and you were saying, there came a point when people have to, or Scottish people, or yes. Brits, had to say something like white people and black people yes. are different. Yes. Now, and that was happening post 
reformation. Yes. So, have you done any research on the theological justification of um, this yes, difference? Yes, yes. How it was justified, and when I come to the anti-slavery things, I'll go into it a little bit more, but how they justified dif treating black skin and white skin differently was that initially they spoke about the fact that the uh, the, the Africans were not Christians and therefore they they were labeled infidels or whatever and and the, and the white people were Christians good Christians so from that we get that idea which is very very strong uh, later that the white people needed to Christianize the black people needed to go missions and whatever but it became an argument here in Scotland that well why don't you just um, start converting them now. You've got these captives. Why don't you start um, teach, giving them Bible lessons and teaching them and letting them become Christians? But of course, that was a very dangerous notion. Um, I mentioned um, the governor of Jamaica that came from Inverary, and I read his letters home. And one of the letters he wrote very strongly saying, you must not... Um, this pressure that's building to uh, um, amongst Christians in Scotland to uh, convert the slaves to Christianity is a very dangerous thought because if they start to read the Bible and they begin to think they're valuable, and so it was seen as a, a, a very bad idea. And he wrote he wrote to the British government when he was a governor to say exactly that that you mustn't even contemplate it. It would be the end of the colony if should you do that. Now, what, um, what I want to uh, go on, um, and just see if I can find, I seem to have lost a few of my markers, but anyway. Um, there, a group of people, <clears throat> after 70, the 1770s, both here in Scotland and in England, um, Legislation was passed to say that you couldn't have slaves. You couldn't be a slave in England or you couldn't be a slave in Scotland. But what that meant was that if an enslaved person in Jamaica could somehow get onto a ship and end up on this side of the Atlantic, as soon as he got off the boat or she got off the boat, they would be free people because they couldn't be enslaved in this country. <laughs> so a growing number of uh, enslaved people did just that. And the streets of London had several thousand black Africans. Uh, of course, when they got here, they might be skilled, they might find jobs, but very many of them didn't. So Cardiff, Liverpool, Cardiff, Bristol, wherever the ships were coming in loaded with sugar and whatever colonial produce, black people were getting off. So there were communities like Topsteth in Liverpool and um, uh, down at the docks in in Cardiff and um, St Paul's in Bristol and there was communities in London too. There were black people in these from the 1600s, communities of black people. That must have been very difficult for them to escape and then to remain undetected on the boats. Absolutely. That must have been incredibly difficult. There, see, but it would have been, but it's, I think it's likely that they were given jobs on the boat because mm. they were, um, or sometimes they were being, the, evidence for some of them in Scotland was that they were being sent home. Um, you, might, you might want them to be trained as carpenters or trained as some skilled job. And one of the ways to do that was to put them on a boat, send them over here, keep them here and teach them the trade and then put them back on the boat. You could, it, was a, it was a business because you could buy them for, what did I say, 17 pounds. But when they were skilled carpenters by the end of the 1700s, they were worth nearly 100 pounds. So you could actually make money by skilling them and sending them back and selling them. And we, that, that happened. But some of those people ran away, escaped, naturally. Were there pirates that were involved in freeing people getting across the you know, but, liberation routes? Were the pirates? Were yeah, there were pirates involved, sort of going against uh, and liberating people? Certainly pirates um, 
pirates did seize ships full of goods that were going down to West Africa. And they also did seize shiploads of people, uh, but they would resell them because they were worth a lot of money. And, and there are, I did find um, that there had been, I, I couldn't quite work out what pirate ships were doing in the west of Scotland, but there's certainly that, I did find um, some history of that. Um, <clears throat> now, what, so in the, um, the, in, so in, in, in London, um, there was a group of people, got, Christian people got together and who were very concerned about the number of black people hanging about on the streets and what could be done about them. And as I said, they set up, um, Freetown on the West Coast, thinking they could take some of them back there and, uh, and have them there. But they also became interested in the whole idea of uh, this slave trade and, what, and, and whether something could be done to stop it. And they began to um, build up uh, their thinking about that. Um, and they, they organized themselves to, uh, to, to try what they wanted to do initially. Because in the late 1700s, now there was such a massive um, lobby in Parliament. So, so our banks were involved. So, so much of our industry, our banking, our money making was involved in some way in slavery that there was a, a, a massive lobby around Parliament. And in fact, the 50, after 1707, the 50 or so um, uh, members of Parliament that we, nobody got a seat in Parliament from Scotland unless they were pro-slavery. They just didn't. Um, it was one of the jobs that Dundas did was to ensure that nobody <coughs> got down there in Parliament unless they were absolutely committed because it was seen as so very important to Scotland that that was the case and they must defend Scotland's uh, wealth, Scotland's industries and Scotland's noble families who were involved in it all. Now, so there, there, there was a group of people in London and um, they were interested in whether they could do something about slavery. And they, they wondered, what, they thought the first thing that they might be able to do was to um, get, an, an get Parliament to inquire into the slave trade, to bring it all out into the open, to have a, 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 a sort of a committee inquiry into what was going on and to, to bring all the facts together. Um, but they needed somebody in, in Parliament to actually propose that. And um, uh, so they, they, they put feelers out around Parliament and thought that Wilberforce, a man called Wilberforce, might be the person to, to do this. Uh, but they, uh, so they asked Wilberforce, and Wilberforce said, yes, he would do it. So they formed a committee, um, an anti-slavery committee. And they, there was a bit of a disagreement in, amongst the committee members as to how this whole anti-slavery movement should be run. There were those, this is, we're now talking about the late 1700s. There were those in the anti-slavery movement like Wilberforce and some of the others who, you have to remember that people didn't have the vote, they hadn't widened the franchise at this point, who thought that the educated and the, the reputable in society should be the only people who got involved in the anti-slavery movement. But there were other members of the, of the, of the group. Uh, Zachary Macaulay was one of those. Um, but, uh, so was, uh, so was the, the Edinburgh Committee. Um, so the, it, the committee was formed in London and then the Edinburgh Commit Committee was formed a bit later. And uh, I'll just give you the, an idea of when, uh, when the anti-slavery movement took off. Um, Nothing like it had ever really happened before. It's the kind of first idea that it's, it set down our ideas of running a campaign. 
People had badges. They boycotted sugar. They had posters. They had, they, they, they sent petitions to parliament. They did all sorts of things like that, which had never really been, uh, been done before. They were, it was a very novel way of doing things. And some of the committee were not too happy about this because you have to think the French Revolution, the American Revolution, people getting involved and getting on the streets and waving banners and putting up posters. They thought it was all a bit worrying. <laughs> they didn't really like the idea. But when uh, a man called, uh, called Dixon, Scotsman, in 1792, um, Dr. Dixon, uh, he was funded by the Abolitionist Committee. He came from down Dumfries area and he was happy to come back up to Scotland. Um, and um, uh, Clarkson, who worked for the anti-slavery group at the time, Thomas Clarkson, um, he was convinced that the common people should be involved. And he wrote to Dr. Dixon explaining that ordinary folk like those of Lead Hills uh, may certainly petition Parliament. The manufacturers of earthenware in Staffordshire um, have done so. Uh, and what's more to the point, the couples in Sheffield have also written to Parliament. So you should encourage the ordinary people when you go up to Scotland. But he needn't have worried about that. Because when William Dixon arrived in Edinburgh in January 1792, he could see that the Scottish Committee had been busy. Um, Plymouth abolitionists had uh, commissioned an engraving of a crammed slave ship. And there is, they had decided that they would um, make that into some posters. The, the abolitionist committee weren't very happy with this. They were, didn't really want to pay the bill for it. But anyway, it had been, um, and the resulting prints illustrated the lower deck of the slave ship packed with slaves. And in December 1788, the local, the local committee had printed 1,500 copies for circulation and sent the plan to London. Posters of an enlarged version of the slave ship had been distributed. And Dixon wrote from Edinburgh, our cause gains ground. The slave ships have been put up in banks and public offices and coffee houses here in Edinburgh and to an excellent effect. So he got here and he could see that the Edinburgh people had been very busy. Not all of the committee members in London were enthusiastic. There were echoes of the Paris Commune and the revolutionary campaign in France associated with posters and it was a step too far for them. The Scottish Committee there was a public in, a, 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 a parliamentary inquiry, and it was masses and masses and masses of pages of material. But the Scottish Committee reduced it down to 128 pages, a summary. And then they produced an even smaller one, 25 pages. And it was called Short Address to the People of Scotland on the Subject of the Slave Trade. You can find this on the internet if you want to have a look at it. And Halliburton, who was the chair of the committee, um, said that he couldn't travel the length and breadth of the country because he was working as an excise man. So he, what he did, um, that he sent out the, uh, the, the, the address to all of the religious Christian organizations all over Scotland. So you can imagine that all of the clerks, all of the church sessions and whatever, were all received this short address to the people of Scotland. So this was probably the first time that such a, a letter explaining all that had been going on um, and explaining the parliamentary inquiry in simple language for ordinary people to sit together <coughs> and have a look at. So it, he knew, they knew, and it was one of the reasons why when they asked for petitions, the Scotland sent more petitions per head of population than any other part of the country. But it was also one reason why many of them were signed by Christian groups. So, so the, the, you would get the, 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 um, the sign or the, or the parish or whatever of different parts of Scotland sending in. And it was partly because they had sent... Um, uh, what we also know is that what they, the, the Kirk Sessions uh, wouldn't need any help in discussing the contents, because the Scottish Christians moved their Bibles, 
and they read their Bibles and they would judge it in that way. So they, they were very, they became very interested in the whole, um, the whole question of slavery. Now, so what would you, so if you, um, so anybody living in Edinburgh, um, would have been faced with not only those, um, not only the posters, but um, I'm just going to see if I've got it here. Yeah, but when, the, when it was time for petitions, they were put in all the shops around Edinburgh for people to sign. So they, you, 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 if you went into the grocers or you went into the bank or you went in, there were posters and then there were all the petitions to sign. So it was very evident here on the streets of Edinburgh at that time um, that, that, that there was that the country was divided. People were divided over this whole uh, question because, of course, there were all the people whose jobs depended on the slave trade and all the people who's, who, in one way or another, their jobs were bound up with it. So it was a very divisive uh, subject. I, I read some letters um, from one, somebody who lived in Edinburgh, and their brother had been sent to work in Liverpool. And obviously... The, uh, this divided their family because they, they, he, the, the man had written to say, we'd love to come down and visit you. And the family in Liverpool had said, you shouldn't come and visit us in Liverpool so long as you don't mention how we make our living. That's our business, not yours. So obviously they'd ha this kind of division uh, in families, in communities uh, was going on at the time. It, was, it wasn't that people didn't know about it. It was, it was you know, people did know and they were very involved in one way or another um, in the whole question. <coughs> now, this is Dundas. And this is, uh, <laughs> uh, he, it, it, it's a cartoon from one of the, uh, one of the, from the Scottish press. And you'll probably be aware that um, Dundas uh, was, he was called the uncrowned king of Scotland because he was so powerful. Um, but he, um, he was the only Scot in the British, um, <coughs> in the, uh, who, who had a post in the British government, and he defended Scotland from there. But you can see that at the time when um, Wilberforce was bringing his first piece of legislation, trying to get it passed through Parliament, Dundas had a problem. And obviously people knew he had a problem because... The cartoons were in the newspapers. So one leg is over in Jamaica. The other leg is on this side of the Atlantic. I don't know whether it's clear on there, but passing underneath him, it's not very clear, are, are the slave ships. And he's obviously dressed in his Scottish regalia, defending Scotland. Um, but he, he had a problem because um, actually the government was anti-slavery. So Dundas had a dilemma to resolve. As a senior cabinet member, he didn't want to openly oppose his Prime Minister Pitt, uh, who was an, an enthusiastic abolitionist. He had received a petition from Edinburgh, which was only rivaled in size by the one from London. Twenty years previously, the Air Bank had collapsed, taking down most of Scotland's banks with it. <laughs> one of the very few Scottish banks which had survived was the Coots, was the bank of the Coots family, which was now based in the Strand in London. And they would no doubt have attended one of Dundas's burgundy and blasphemy parties in Wimbledon to remind him, uh, remind him that government had already been required to bail out the banks, the West, the West Indian merchant bankers, who had been rather too enthusiastic in giving loans for slave purchase and had accumulated a lot of bad debts. Another shock to the system would have serious consequences for Scottish banking. Moreover, transatlantic trade was about to become very difficult because we, they declared war on France. So this is the background to the legislation, Wilberforce proposing to legislation to end the slave trade to Parliament. Um, Dundas spoke for Scotland at Westminster. He was sometimes referred to as the uncrowned king of Scotland, and he could not there possibly allow Scotland's banks and commercial success to be undermined by the sudden disruption of the labour supply to the colonies. 
but he also recognised the personal stake of many of his Tory friends in Scotland. So he, when he proposed, as he did, um, a, a, to, he, he inserted into the legislation that the abolition, um, that he you inserted know, the word gradually. So he's kind of hedging, uh, I felt when I looked at all of that, that he was, uh, when he put the word gradually in there, um, but the, the, there were 10,885 signatures from the Edinburgh population. Now, the Edinburgh population at that time was only 400,000. So it, it was a vast, vast number of people who lived here who felt strongly about the issue. But at the same time, there was the problem of the jobs and the banks and the money all involved. And so these political dilemmas are not, you know, we have these political dilemmas today. They're not new, are they? They, 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 were right, they could go back, right back to them. I think the population of Edinburgh was 400,000. 400,000 at the time, uh, the, the, the population of, of Greater Edinburgh. They can't yeah. have been as big as that. Mm? They can't have been as big as that at that time. Do you think? Yeah. The wider area. 40,000, maybe. Well, the, the, the signatures were 10885. So I, I, I take your word for it then. I may be wrong about the population of Edinburgh, but there's certainly the, um, the, the signatories to the petition that was handed to Dundas from the anti-slavery movement had 10,000 signatures on it. So it, 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 it was a very, um, you can see how people pictured it as a, as a difficult moment and what would, what would he do? Um, and by adding gradually, um, the legislation got talked out. So there were lots of other, the, the rest of the pro-slavery movement came in behind and, 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 um, and talked the legislation out and it wouldn't come back again until 1807. <clears throat> so it, it, this slavery was finally ended in, um, in the slave trade was ended in 1807, but not the institution of slavery. That remained. And actually people found their way around it because the the, they were, they were, the Spanish still had slaves that were, you know, they could buy, they could buy elsewhere and they, um, it, they did find ways around it, although things were a bit more difficult. So 1807 was the, um, the ending of the actual trade. But the, the institution of slavery remained. And as India became more, um, as we became more involved in India and as we, we began to uh, colonize in India, we, um, the India began to send sugar to Britain uh, began to produce sugar and send it to Britain. It was produced by wage earning. Obviously, wages may not have been very much, but, but they were not slaves, the people who were producing it. So question, the question, whole question of slavery came up again, saying, well, if India can produce uh, sugar, and don't you tell us that it has to be done by slaves. Well, if India can do, do it without slaves, then why can't we do something about, our, um, about slavery in the Caribbean? And Parliament, so the, 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 the anti-slavery movement got off, the, got off the ground again. And the argument was put that, um, I'm just looking for a little piece in my book which describes. So what was put through, um, it was put to Parliament that they needed to um, restore some of the rights to enslaved people that families should be kept together, husbands and wives, that children shouldn't be, little children shouldn't be sold out of families, that they should be entitled to uh, go to churches and to become Christians, that so the, to return very many of those rights, that punishments were, um, were, were lessened, court procedures were brought in for 
serious misdemeanor, misdemeanors. So, so the, the, the management of slaves um, was a, a whole list of legislation. That was much discussed in the Scottish press. If you'd been in Edinburgh at the time, you would have seen all the discussion about the various, uh, the various points that were agreed. So off <coughs> that legislation was sent to Jamaica. And the Jamaican Assembly, so they had a, they, they were obviously a British colony, but they had an assembly. Jamaican Assembly absolutely refused to implement it. They said, no, we're not doing it. And um, so there was a kind of a standoff. The British government was worried because uh, they had lost their American colony not too many years before, and they didn't want to lose Jamaica because Jamaica was actually worth more in money terms than all the tobacco in Virginia or whatever. It was a very important uh, source of revenue to the British government. It was also a very important underpinning of much of the uh, source of capital for the development of England and Scotland. So the, um, the <coughs> they were, so the, part of, there was a kind of a standoff between, between Britain and Jamaica. And during that period, there was, um, there was an outbreak, a, a, a revolt on the Scottish estates. You remember I said that, um, uh, that the Scots had settled in the western side of Jamaica. And at that time, uh, there, was a, there was a revolt. Um, the, in the summer of 1823, which is when the, um, when the legislation had been sent out to Jamaica, and the, a, a revolt broke out on Argyle Estate of the resident Scottish slave owner, John Malcolm. He came from Argyle, and that's why he called his estate Argyle, and uh, so that all those lads from Argyle who might not arrive in the west of uh, the country could find him. Uh, so he, he um, the Malcolms by now, when the Malcolms arrived in, in Jamaica, they were cattle dealers, and they'd set up a cattle farm. But then they, a, a hundred years later, or just 70 odd years later, um, John Malcolm was living on the estate uh, uh, with his wife, his five children, slave wife, I should say, and five children and 244 slaves. Their next door neighbours uh, were in Golden Grove and they were, that was managed by another Scotsman, William Miller, for a Mr. Hudson, who was actually a member of parliament. So there was a whole group of Scottish estates, Alexandria, um, where the, the revolt broke out because the, the enslaved people knew that they had been granted these rights. The king had sent them to Jamaica and they were being refused and, and they were, were not getting these rights that they wanted. And they, um, so they, they, what they did was they actually took over all those plantations and, and uh, chased away the planters and their families. So when the militia arrived to put down the rebellion, all of the Africans ran into the hillside forests from which they held up for some time by making sporadic attacks on the well-armed troops. The revolutionary spirit was only finally suppressed by the appearance of a major general, this is the army coming out now, commanding a large and well-armed detachment of the 92nd Regiment. This show of strength promptly ensured most of the insurgents on the Argyle estate returned to order, but the revolt continued on Golden Grove, Alexandria, and other properties in and around Hanover. Now, so the, the, um, if the, the, the press in Scotland covered this in detail, and the pro-slavery press talked about how, uh, how well they'd actually um, fought to get the slaves back to work, back to their, uh, on, you know, under control, and other parts of the press discussed the anomaly that actually what they were fighting for was something they'd been granted by Parliament and were entitled to. So the Scottish press was divided on this question. Three of the freedom fighters from our the Gael estate refused to return. Governor Manchester reported that these three, John Clark, John Miller and Ben Reynolds, killed themselves 
stating that they preferred to die as free men rather than be captured and killed as slaves. The court in the town of Lucia tried 11 men from the Argyle estate and seven from Golden Grove, and they executed 13. At the request of John Malcolm, the court decreed that the 11 from Argyle should be hanged publicly in John Malcolm's mill yard. There were horrible scenes as the brave Argyle slaves attempted to rescue their fellow captives. <clears throat> so the, 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 um, the, 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 this public hanging was intended to really teach them all a lesson. Um, but be, the governor, Governor Manchester, uh, sent home a graphic account, and he uh, he he was of the view that actually what they were fighting for, they were entitled to, because it had been granted by the king and the British government. Um, Although John Clark, John Miller, and Ben Reynolds, and the unnamed Eleven gained nothing from the revolt against their masters, they did gain a lot of respect from their community. They chose to die as free men, and they spoke bravely of the continued fight for rights and justice, and called on their fellow slaves to continue the war, even as they went to their deaths. And they were remembered by the surviving slaves, Argyle became a word for resistance. It was what they used as kind of, uh, you know, when they were uh, plotting or whatever. Argyle was used as a word for resistance. So the from then onwards, this is this is in uh, uh, twenty six eighteen twenty six. From then onwards, um, the Jamaica became somewhat ungovernable. The governors wrote home to say it's very, you know, that, 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 that we're dealing with constant problems on the estates. But on this side of the Atlantic, um, changes have gone on here too. The, in 1832, there was a reform of the franchise and more, um, quite a different, and there was an election held and quite a different set of people went into the House, uh, House of Commons. Um, so Scotland swept out all of those uh, pro-slavery people who'd been there before. And there were none of them left when, in, in 1832. The same kind of process went on in parts of England. So by 1832, there was chaos in Jamaica and there was a strong parliamentary and a new parliamentary feeling and that's the slave legislation went through but it wasn't entirely due to the abolitionists it was partly due to the fact that the enslaved in Jamaica had made the whole place ungovernable so but during that period this is from the Glasgow Herald um, the this is, this is a petition to the Westminster Parliament, basically from the Jamaican Assembly, but from the planters in the Jamaican Assembly. And you can see that they're now saying that the slaves were a contented race of people obedient to their masters. I've just been telling you what was actually going on in Jamaica, but they're writing to the Glasgow Herald. People actually had read it in the Glasgow Herald, both sides of the story, so they wouldn't necessarily be taken in by this. Um, but uh, so wicked attempts have been made to stir up dissatisfaction and um, we predict destruction of your majesty's colony um, and this is signed by David Finlayson, Scottish Scotsman um, who, who actually had uh, also had a slave wife and <coughs> eight children. This is another one I should say, do you remember I said about you could, re you could remortgage your slaves well, this is one way that some of these beautiful houses were actually built in Scotland. Can't say for certain, but this is Paul Tallick House. That's the Malcolm's house. One way that they could raise that kind of finance to, to rebuild, to, 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 you know, some of, some of the most beautiful uh, houses and buildings in Scotland were built, paid for by those kind of mortgages, which you'd remember paid for by hardworking young girls in the fields. Um, and this is uh, 
petition from the West Indian merchants. So the, this is the merchants, the bankers, um, and they're t they're saying that um, if the mortgages, and this is one reason why compensation was paid, because if the banks had lots of bad debts, and they would have, if you immediately freed the slaves, then all that land in Jamaica becomes worthless, and you might have mortgages on all of these slaves, um, and and you're cancelling those. You've got so many bad debts, so it it was a danger to the financial establishment as well. And one of the reasons why a lot of the money that was paid out in compensation at the time of the ending of slavery was actually about saving the banks as much as anything, because there was a great fear. I don't know exactly what the proportion was, um, but there was a fear that that was that there were too many mortgages. And this is the, the merchants are saying, uh, West Indian securities are nearly valueless uh, as transferable property. Uh, there's alarm at the mortgages uh, the, and people who are holding various securities on land and slaves in Jamaica could lose a lot of money. <clears throat> All of this would have been readable in the Scottish press at the time. But eventually, the slaves were freed. And um, I'll just read you a little piece from the Scotsman. I can find it. Uh, right. There it is. Now, the Scotsman advertised an elegant and well executed cheap medal with the figure of a Negro and rays of light descending upon him, his head being lifted up towards heaven in an expression of gratitude. In his uplifted hands are pieces of broken chain and the words record of the extinction of colonial slavery in the reign of William. So there were enough people in Scotland who, were, who had been interested in this or had taken part in this who would want to buy this medal. I mean, the, the Scotsman was, um, it did say it's a cheap medal. I thought that was a bit much. But anyway, it's a well, elegant and well executed so you could buy yourself a medal if you'd taken part in the anti-slavery campaign or signed one of these petitions. You could, you could have yourself a, a little souvenir. But I think one of the sad things is that um, although the legal battle was won, I think the propaganda war was not really won. That the sense, because this is some of the illustrations from that time, that the, the, um, the, the sense that white people were some, the supremacy of white people and the degradation of black people. A lot of the imagery from those times reproduces that. And it makes me feel that although the legal battle was won, there was still a sort of anti-black feeling um, and also a sense that, that white people were somehow superior. And I want to go back to Zachary Macaulay because what Zachary did during the whole campaign was he provided all the research. He wrote a column for the Christian Observer, which kept everybody up to date which, with what was happening in the colonies, what was happening about slavery and the anti-slavery movement. He issued a newspaper called the Anti-Slavery Observer. He did a full-time job in the meanwhile. He had nine children. Um, so he was a very busy man. <laughs> at one point he wrote, I'm sorry I'm late with whatever it was, but all the children have been at home. And I can just imagine it. But he, um, but he, he also, when the parliamentary um, inquiry was going on, he supplied it with masses of material. He had a head for figures and an ability to simplify down complex uh, questions. And when there was debates in Parliament, he was always on hand to give Wilberforce whatever uh, information he needed. He was their, their researcher. He was their propagandist. He was their, he public, you know, he, he did an amazing job. And at the, <coughs> yes, he has a statue in Westminster Abbey. And it says that uh, Zachary McCauley, with an intense and quiet perseverance, devoted his time, his talents, fortune, and all the energies of his mind and body to the service of the most injured and helpless of mankind. And who 
partook for more than 40 successive years and, and rescued the British Empire from the guilt of the slave trade and finally conferred freedom on 800,000 slaves. This tablet is erected by those who drew wisdom from his mind and lessons from his life. And, um, yeah, that's the end there. But uh, what is very sad is that the country that produced that person with who devoted all his time and talents, the country that actually, uh, you know, made him, has doesn't own him, has never wanted to own him. Um, he's, he's um, as far as I know, there, um, didn't mean to take him off. As far as I know, there is no plaque, no recognition, not even in his hometown in Inverary. So I'm on a bit of a mission. I think we ought to have, a stat if we can have a statue to Dundas, who certainly did a lot of work to defend Scotland in other fields. I think we should have one to Zachary Macaulay. Okay. So, comments, thoughts? Um, most of the sugar that we use now comes from sugar beet. Yes. And it's all processed in the factory in Great Yarmouth. Yes. Um, so when did the uh, sugar beet going to take over and the sugar cane? Actually quite early on. Actually, quite as far as I know, by the mid 1800s, with the the um, when slavery ended, um, people many of the planters just simply walked away from their estates because they couldn't see that how without the workers they did try bringing in indentured labour and whatever, but people quite quickly looked for other ways of making sugar, and so by the mid 1800s. We were beginning to extract it from sugar beet, and that whole period of, of you know, working in the fields was over. Although in Afri other parts of the British colonies, in Africa and in, in, in India, we did, did continue to plant and produce sugar there with, with um, paid labour. Yeah, I think I remember okay. when I was very young that uh, cane sugar was marked on the back. Yes, the yes. Maybe yes. it was slightly finer or something. Yes, it was. A, um, good cane sugar always was at a premium. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that planters had to do was to, they, they would hire in sometimes a sugar boiler. There were famous sugar boilers in Jamaica, slave sugar boilers, who were known to be able to produce a very fine sugar. And um, they, were, they were much prized and they, they would go around the different plantations supervising the, um, the, the, the production of the sugar. So people had, um, you know, very, uh, you could get a lot more money for good sugar yeah. than, than poor sugar, obviously. And, and there were various qualities of sugar and the, the top quality was good cane sugar. Um, but I'm sure in India and in Africa, they, they eventually began to produce that. But I think we're quite used now to beet sugar, as you say. I was, a lot of interesting things. Thanks a lot. I've learned, I've learned a lot. But I was partly interested in the role of uh, banks as uh, investors in Scotland. Mm -hmm. you, that was vital to the mm. early years, particularly maybe. But but you also mentioned that you know, there have been bank collapses. And mm -hmm. So did 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 the slave trade cease to be so important? Why, well, no, why did those collapses happen? Why did the collapses happen? The bank From why time to time, that? if there was a really bad harvest, if there was hurricanes or something like that in Jamaica, then people, uh, a considerable number of people might not meet their mortgages. So that was a problem. Wartime, it was sometimes very hard to... There were many European wars in that period, the yes. 17, early 1800s. And get it, so at times, getting the ships back uh, with all, all of the goods could be a problem. And or getting the ships down to West Africa to pick up slaves to replace the ones that were worn out, it was described as. But, but, so there were periods when things didn't go well. And, they, uh, and at that time, the British government would to tide them over would bail out the banks. 
And um, but there were some spectacular failures. The the the, um, the air bank, the linen bank. Um, there were some spectacular failures, uh, because also there was people wanted to get in on this business that was making so much money. It's a bit like the internet now, I think. Or, or I'm not an expert on that, but you know how people want to get into the newest thing that's going. And so they jump on a bandwagon, and from time to time there were these rushes to get involved, and, and, and some bad lending that went on. So if that bad lending happened to be in a bad year for harvests, there were collapses. So it, it really, there was a huge amount of money coming in, but it was also probably very unstable, and there was a fear about it. Yes? Can you just tell us a bit more about the slaves? What sort of, I mean, first of all, how did they become slaves? I'm, I'm coming forward because I don't hear all that well. Okay, so shout up a little bit. I, I wonder whether you have any information about the slaves and how they first became slaves. And also you mentioned children before. Yes. So were the children, did they come from Africa or were they born? A very, that's a very interesting question because um, how did they become slaves? Initially, uh, there's nobody left Africa that wasn't captured in Africa. I said Bunce Island kept the slaves in a in a, a fortress, and there were forts on the on the coast. But initially, they captured. Um, they, they were they, they were the spoils of war in a way. When 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 one African group had been fighting with another, the the prisoners were all shipped out as slaves. Um, but as the demand for workers became greater, and sometimes there was a, they looked for particular specialities. Like the Oswalds made a speciality of looking for women rice growers, capturing them and shipping them out to help with the development of the Carolina rice industry. Um, that's, they, 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 there was a premium on people. Uh, so, I suppose what I'm saying is that initially they might have been captives of war, but after a while they were just seized. And 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 but who was seizing them? Not not the Scots going in there and seizing them. I think there probably were very few left Africa who weren't seized by Africans. There is a black history there of and who had all this goods that was you know the shiploads of goods. Um, so men, women, and children were all seized. Women with particular kinds of growing skills, men with particular kinds of, of skills, they were not necessarily unskilled people. They were often targeted because they had particular skills. It was quite a sophisticated business. But I think the proportion of children, um, some, if you go on to the database of slave ships, sometimes they know how many men, how many women, and how many children. And there were a surprising number of children brought um, brought over because children started work on plantations at the age of six years old. Um, not, not necessarily, they, they, they did weeding and they did those, those um, lighter, perhaps, is it a light job weeding? Not really. Um, they did all those jobs and they, then they learnt all about the plantation. And by the time they were 9, 10, 11, they were going out with the field gang. So the, that's why I'm saying the pictures that we saw don't bear out. When you look at the paperwork, um, so on a plantation, you might have, you would have a, a sugar boiler, a very important person that who burnt the, boiled the sugar, very skilled. And actually the family's fortune depended on his skill in boiling sugar. You would have the, all those who helped in the boiling process. Then you'd have the ones that worked in the fields. You'd have the ones that looked after the, um, the there was a lot, of, the fertilizer was provided by cattle. So you had boys who looked after the cattle and brought the fertilizer, the, all of the cattle dung to the fields. And then you had mules who pulled the carts that, um, that carried all the, um, sugar to the mill and it's heavy stuff so cartloads and cartloads you would have um, the cooks and the house servants who looked after the planter family um, and they were very important people they learned to make haggis and all sorts of 
fancy dishes that we like to eat. You know, they, they were skilled. They made all the, they made clothing and they made all the bedding and all of that sort of thing. So there were all of these different sorts of jobs. There were, they, sometimes they, they had to clear extra, more land. So they would have people to chop down the trees. They had carpenters who made all their furniture from those trees. So there were a lot of skilled people on a plantation who were slaves. And the families, <clears throat> one of the, the, one of the things which um, was in the legislation to improve slave lives in 1823 was that the children should be kept with their family. They shouldn't be sold because if they, if the uh, planter runs short of money or if somebody um, needed money for, I don't know, to go home to Scotland to university, it might sell a couple of the kids young children as slaves, put them in the slave market, get the money and um, use it. There were examples like that. I'm not saying all of the planters were, were cruel like that because there were a substantial number of planters. Um, um, the, uh, a number of Scottish families felt who inherited in the late 1700s, early 1800s, you could inherit a plantation that your family had had for years and were uncomfortable with the idea because they perhaps, you know, morally, didn't, they didn't think it was right. And they set up some of the first missions, um, sending, you, there was a law against, <coughs> um, there was a law against bringing missionaries into Jamaica and into the other Caribbean islands, but you could do what you like with your own slave to own them. So you could send your own missionary and have your own little church, and have your own little school for the children, if that's how you wanted to run things. And there are d examples of a, you know, quite a number of families who did that. So although I've read to you about the atrocity that happened on, the, you know, on those Scottish estates, and there was a government inquiry into that to look into it all, and uh, at which they gave evidence, and you can read all that. But there were also another side of things where people... Um, who thought differently and wanted to get on with this idea of, grad, you know, Dundas had said gradually, and maybe some people really did believe in that gradually, that we'll change things in the next few years just by doing it gradually. <laughs> and so it mixed picture in some ways. You mentioned that there was sort of a boom in uh, doctors training in Scotland to yes. serve on these slave ships. I mean, they weren't doctoring for the slaves, they were, for what they presumably were just there to say, this one's going to be no good yeah, for the um, yeah? I, I, Or were they... Were we they don't actually, really know too, yeah. I don't really know too much about the curriculum, mm. but certainly the doctors who went to Jamaica, when, when the slaves arrived in Jamaica, um, they were from the early 1700s, long before we had smallpox vaccination in Britain, they... They, um, they shipped over live uh, pox, cowpox vaccine and, and, and all of the slaves were, um, they were all vaccinated. Now, and they also were checked because you'd bought them and you had a mortgage on them. You really didn't want to, you, knew, you had an interest in keeping them alive. Um, but because of that, in those early years, Scottish medical schools became very proficient or more proficient than perhaps other ones in tropical medicine. Their reputation in tropical medicine was partly to do with how much doctoring they had done in, um, in, in, in the tropics, in the colonies. So they, and the schools in Argyle in 1742, I think it is, they inoculated the school children in Argyle. Well, that's long, long before this, that was going on anywhere else. But it was partly because there were doctors who were learning all about, I mean, they were, they were doing the job, but they were also learning about the sorts of diseases that the work, because we're having an exchange in a way of diseases. We took all our diseases to Jamaica and gave them to the slaves. The slaves were bringing theirs giving them to white people. So the doctors who were in the middle of that learned an awful lot about um, tropical medicine and about 
um, about the spread of disease uh, in all sorts of ways. And so there's a lot of interesting medical history there that you that and here in Scotland in particular, because we were producing um, a lot of the doctors. And uh, um, so I did, the medical curriculum, I didn't go into too much detail there, but there's, there is a, in, if you were interested in it, there's a lot of, lot written about it now, about how the expertise that was built up. And um, some of it, um, you know, quite pioneering. And it did lead, as I said, to smallpox was a big killer. Uh, here of, of children, and um, uh, it did lead to the inoc early inocula inoculation of children, certainly in, in Argyll, um, in the 1740s. But we, well, slaves were inoculated, and sometimes uh, they would they had this thing they called seasoning, where they would keep them separate from the others uh, in their first um, <clears throat> up to a year. Sometimes keep them separate. So that they didn't um, become ill, uh, you know, pick up the bugs and and and, and uh, illnesses that were uh, that were prevalent in Jamaica. They kept them rather separate from the rest, so they didn't suddenly, because because quite often people would arrive, white people would arrive, and they would pick up something and be dead, probably, <coughs> you know, because they that, they had no defences. To all those tropical bugs and the, and the people coming from West Africa had no defence against all the European bugs. So um, there was a, uh, there was and there was a huge problem with um, venereal disease because of the amount of um, e uh, sexual exploitation of slaves and the, all of that. So the seasoning it wasn't just for the slaves, the enslaved people; it was also for um, workers coming over from Scotland to work on the plantations. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't know whether the Scots, the most of the people who went to Jamaica were male. In you know, workers who went to Jamaica from Scotland were male. It was a thing that young blokes did, you know, to go and make some money. You you can read a lot of stuff about them. Um, they, they, their ambition was to spend maybe four or five years there, make enough money that when they came back, they could actually buy a small farm or buy a plot of land or and 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 uh, get married and have their own families. So that there's quite a lot of letters you can find um, talking about that kind of thing. But many of them did just die. Many of them went and their parents never heard of them again because they arrived in Jamaica and picked up some bug and that, that was that, you know. Um, I'm sure that, I'm sure men, hard to say the proportion because um, you just get overall figures, you know. And I also think we underestimate how many went because I think there were official passages where you, you bought your ticket and whatever, but I think there were boats in all the little ports all around Scotland. I can just imagine that young guys would say, I can help out, do this, do that on, on board, and they get on and off they go. Because also, the <clears throat> at one point, several points in the period I'm talking about, when a ship brought uh, new people from Scotland or England into Jamaica. They were paid for each one they landed because they were so desperate to have extra white workers that they actually paid for them. So one of the best cargoes going the other way, going from here over the, to, to the Caribbean was to actually fill your boat with people, young men who could work because you got paid for them. We didn't have an awful lot else. We, I talk, spoke about the fish and the linen and whatever, but the next best set export was people who could work. Did you want to say something? Can I ask another question? Yeah. So, so um, you said when slavery was abolished in 1834, yeah. a lot of the landowners left, just left. Yes. Um, so what, what about the emancipated slaves? Right. Did they tend to... to they take over work in the land, or did a lot of them uh, leave? Yeah, no, leave no, or no, they happened? stayed. Um, the, at the end of um, one of the ways I got involved in this was that one of the communities we stayed in in Jamaica told me that they were squatters, and mm -hmm. they were living in little plot, little houses all round um, along the seashore, um, 
and they families have been there for generations because you could see gravestones. The grandfathers have been buried there and everything. And they said we're squatters, and the people who own the land have come back, and they're going to throw us off because they now could see that the, there's a, there's money to be made along that shore because Jamaica's a tourist destination these days. So the mountains and certain areas. Um, so they they walked away, but they held on to their legal papers very often. And those papers have been perhaps bought and sold or handed down in families. So about a third of modern Jamaicans are actually squatting on land they don't own. Uh, I, I don't know. We we um, we stayed in two or three places with squatters, and they um, they've been in touch with me recently about the problems that they're having. But so the the, the they stayed, and very often they would skill. They were carpenters. They knew about, um, they, they were cooks or they were, so they began to use those skills and live a kind of sort of peasant lifestyle where they could make a bit of money as well. So they might do, the women might do a bit of sewing work and the men might do a bit of carpentry. They, they planted their mar, uh, sort of little market garden on the land and they might go and market some of that. So they began to build up a kind of, um, not quite African, but, you know, a, a, a kind of family, peasant family lifestyle for themselves, uh, buying and selling and doing whatever. But I'm sure also they, you know, they'd never had any leisure. And I just imagine they probably got in their hammocks and enjoyed <laughs> having a bit of rest and being with their children and, and having t women constantly were in trouble for being late for work because they were trying to feed their babies. And, you know, not having time to feed your baby. I, I just thought at the end of slavery to be able to sit in, in, in peace and feed your baby must have been uh, wonderful. Um, but some of them did stay on. Some of the planters stayed on and, and converted their plantations to uh, wage earning, wage pay. But the, to, we don't, there wasn't a very good record there because what happened was that they... They gave them wages, but then, of course, they charged them rent for the houses. And, and um, the plant, they, many of the enslaved ex-slaves found themselves not that much better off because of the way things were working out. Because they had been, they built their own houses mostly, but they were being housed for, they didn't pay rent as slaves. They were given clothing, as I said, linen clothing. They were given some fish, some protein each each week. And there was a doctor on the plantation. So those there were a certain amount of basic services there, which of course when the when slavery ended, they were left without any of that. Mm -hmm. they, you know, that, that was all unless you stayed on and earned wages on the plantation where things might stay pretty much the same, but you wouldn't be very well off because the wages would be very low. And also the competition for Jamaican sugar was growing and growing. And it, one wonders if, it, if the whole system could have been maintained anyway much after the 1830s, because as we said, Indian sugar and beet sugar and all sorts of other um, competition was coming in. So it would, perhaps wouldn't, but some of those sugar plantations are still running today, but not very many, N nothing, you know, nothing compared to what was there in the past. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm aware of uh, uh, people, working class people in the mills and factories uh, in the Manchester area yeah. uh, writing letters in uh -huh. places like Blackburn yeah. uh, are being very involved in anti-slavery. Mm. That, and I'm just trying to place in my mind some other historical events and whether they <clears throat> they had um, uh, uh, impact in this area. So thinking about the Peterloo massacre uh, and mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the, a very big um, call for representation in mm -hmm. the, the legal uh, system. Mm -hmm. But but also I'm thinking about the, the Haitian Revolution. Yes, and yes. The Dominican Republic. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, were, are those historical events for representation uh, 
tied up in, in narratives that they were being, you know. The, 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 because the Caribbean islands are fairly close together and ships went between them, so enslaved people in um, in Jamaica were very aware when there was revolts and revolutions in and the, and the French, you know, the Jamaican Republic and Haiti, they were very, very aware of that. Um, the, um, I think that the working class movements became involved in the anti-slavery campaign in, in some ways, but they also learned from it because it was a, it was a, it, it, in the late 1800s, it was a, a mass kind of way of campaigning and getting people involved. And that had not really happened in that same way. Using the printing press, you know, using the, the newspapers, sending out press releases, writing letters to the papers, all that kind of thing. And it, it was a kind of model for some of the things that happened later. And perhaps, um, and the, the, some interesting research done showing how the overlap between the two, how one, uh, you know, taught another and, and how people learn from each other. But all that stuff about public meetings and, and, and posters and whatever all, all um, grew up during that time. And, and actually, until very recently, and the internet disrupted it. I think, you know, the, the badges and the posters were roughly <laughs> and the leaflets in the street and all of that. That they that were invented during the anti-slavery years were roughly how um, other issues were carried on here in in Edinburgh and Glasgow. I think. Yeah, the way you were explaining it, it predates it, um, the Chartist movement. Yeah. So yes, it that did. Would have been the model. For yes. To carry on. Yes. <laughs> and, and, yes. The yes. And the the um, yes, it did in that way. Yeah. Uh, but. I suppose the, the in the latter stages they would have uh, um, influenced each other, but it was the it was the organised nature of the of the written using the written word and the and, and using the newspapers and all of that that I think was really impressive, um, and the 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 sending out of information because people began the more educate. If you couldn't read, people could read it to you. And there was a, there was enough literate people in communities to be able to read stuff and and to know what was going on. You know that when people were uh, when Zachary Macaulay was sending out what was happening in Jamaica or ha what it was like to be a slave in the fields and all of that, um, people could read that and they could share it and they could talk about it. So it wasn't as if something was happening in Jamaica and something happening on this side of the Atlantic. There was backwards and forwards all the time of information and letters and all of that. So it took a while for it to get across the sea, but it didn't stop it coming, you know. So people knew so much um, and were interested in the world, I think, um, because it was fairly new you know, the, to have that kind of global connection. Going back to the beginning, and, yes. and I, I think what I picked up was that a lot of the legislation was suddenly written in, you know, there was, there was invention in law, it feels a bit like Rwanda at the moment, I have to yes, say, yes, yes. you know, what you want to do, you better get quickly get that into legal yes. terms. Yes, yes. Is there any evidence of a difference uh, initially um, because of Scots law being separate? Was there any kind of questioning of the kind of, of legislation that was suddenly being put in place? No, because the, the Scots played quite a strong role in the uh, Jamaican Assembly. And I wondered if Scots law... Scots law took a different tack in any way, but I don't. I couldn't find any evidence of that. And when you look at the um, the Jamaican Assembly, where um, very harsh, hard attitudes were expressed, some of the planter community 
would have been opposed to what was going on in the Jamaican Assembly. But the Jamaican Assembly was, um, and Scots played a very outspoken role there. There was a, now, just to give you a little example of um, just uh, <clears throat> after 1832, when there was what was called the Baptist War, it was a very big revolt in, um, no, I have to go back. The, when I, I said that some Scottish Christians who were involved in estates sent over missionaries. So they, they were of the view that we'd have to change things. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with um, managing this estate in, in the way that historically it's been managed. We're going to change things. Um, and Scottish planters, um, groups of Scottish planters got together and um, destroyed the churches, burnt down the churches and destroyed the churches that these other Scots had. They were so opposed to it and they were so angry that they had a, an organisation. Um, it was called the Christian Union. Um, they had an organisation to prevent these more liberal-minded Scots doing what they wanted to do. And they, uh, because they saw them as responsible for undermining the discipline in the slave community. And they saw them as, as putting ideas in their heads. Um, I'm not sure I could find the pages in the book, but, but, but if I do cover it in the book because they were, they, they were very vociferous in opposition. So we weren't, although the community was divided, the, the dominant part of that, Scottish Jamaica community was very outspoken pro-slavery, um, which you can't get away from it. That's how it was. <laughs> um, you would like to think that they weren't, but I think they were. <laughs> you mentioned that there was a certain hate that was to pro-slavery by certain varieties. Yes. Can you bring to mind some examples of which line uh, different it, no, the, there was a newspaper called the Inverness Courier, and the the um, the Caledonian Thank you. Thank you. I know Caledonian. I think it's called the Caledonian Mercury. Was funded by and supported by the pro-slavery, and that was published in Glasgow. The Inverness Courier, after the eighteen twenties, followed very closely um, the anti-slavery. Uh, movement and also published the debates in Parliament about slavery and asked the question, you know, what has happened to the legislation? Because it was passed in Parliament and it still hadn't been implemented in Jamaica. And they, um, there was a speech to Parliament about, which I quote in the book, about um, what has happened to this legislation. It should have come forward and it's not in the Queen, the King's speech this year. You know, what it seems to have got lost and where has it gone? And the Inverness uh, Curio, uh, you know, covered all of that. So they took up different lines. Um, and the, obviously the Scotsman um, in publishing the medal and all of that was, was latterly more supportive of the, of the anti-slavery and, and more um, to the anti-slavery movement. But yes, the, the newspapers divided and they, 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 they reported things you know, if there was an uprising in Jamaica, some would, you know, report it as a, a terrible event, but thank God we put it down. And the others would be <laughs> reporting it in a different way. You could see the different points of view. Well, I'm just uh, checking here. Uh, in 1750, Edinburgh had a population of 57,000. Right. What about by the end of the, towards the end of the century? When 18, 1801, they had 81,000. 81,000, so the 400,000 yeah. definitely is wrong, yeah. unless it's a much wider uh, yeah. area. Well, there's mm -hmm. a very well known painting, well, it's actually two paintings together, mm. and it's kind of George the Third, George the Third, and some of George Street is named after him, mm. and it's got him arriving at these docks. Yeah. And there's meant to be a, about 400,000 people, mm -hmm. but the population of Edinburgh is about, you know, 
Mm. So that's mm. correct. Mm. That, that's well, right. I stand corrected then. And then they have another painting of him going along uh, what to be placed. Mm -hmm. And again, the same number of people. Mm. And somehow, all these huge number of people, if they'd existed, could get from Leith Dogs up to Prince Street mm. as quickly as the King could. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> and basically, these paintings were just done that they could send them to the king to make him feel more yes. popular. Yes, yes. Um, you know, but that to, makes it even more um, remarkable how many signatures they have, doesn't it? Mm. That there was that strong feeling. Mm. Um, I was wondering, you said that the slave owners were compensated as part of the legislation. Yes. Was there any compensation for the slaves or any, no. anything to help them? No, transition nothing. I had naively thought there was mm. when I was talking to people when I was in Jamaica. I sort of naively thought, well, surely they gave them some land or they... Uh, something, but no, nothing. So they were just left. They were just left. Just get on with it. To get on with it. But the but the but the British government sent out assessors who went to all the estates and had a look at all the slaves and put a price on them all and added it all up and then there was some um, adjudication and then they finally paid out the money. So they paid the money but to the slave owners. Yes. For, yes. For and it was such a massive loan that the British government took out, that we only finished paying it off during the Blair years. It was the biggest loan that we have ever, ever taken out. The British government has ever taken out. And it, it, was, it was just massive, it was massive. But it gives you some idea in a way of what, what that whole edifice, they thought it was worth, you know, <laughs> because it, they needed so much money. To pay it off. It is horrendous. It's almost like the legislation didn't treat the slaves as people either. Yeah. You weren't yeah. as good. Yeah. You'd also think the slaves would be battling about land and you know, fighting over over what land there was available and such so like. And um, later on <laughs> later on, um the I mean the some of the some of the plantation owners stayed, some of them walked away, and those who've been living on those plots of land kind of just settled down. And if there was no sugar being produced, there wasn't really a shortage of land. There was a lot of land just lying fallow, and they just started using it. But they were not using it for big cash crop ventures. They were using it in a way to go back to the old lifestyle that they would have had in Africa, yeah. although some of them would be several generations down the line by then. Um, but they went back to a kind of subsistence farming with a few skills and, and um, a bit of market gardening on the side, you know, they, they um, because there were quite well-established little towns. And so they could, you know, do a bit of baking and a bit of, you know, uh, selling goods and chickens. They did always, the slaves on their little plots where they were, that were supposed to feed them, they did always also help to feed the white population because the white population had no idea about growing crops in, in tropical areas. And, and also, they just expect, so they allowed the slaves in a way. And that meant that slaves had little businesses going on and had money in their pockets more than we might imagine uh, because they were uh, raising pigs and, um, and, and chickens and eggs and whatever and, and supplying that. There were big markets in Jamaica selling all this stuff and uh, the, the, the cooks and, and um, house servants, slaves that went to the market and bought, bought what was needed for... Uh, to, to sustain the family. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah.